as you can see, that one of my favorite ways of worship is through the music. Um, and it's not the only way of, of worshiping the Lord. That is, that's just happens to be one of my favorites. There's, there's plenty of ways. There's, there's the offering. There's the edification through, through scripture. Um, there are many, many different, many, many different forms. I believe the Bible speaks about seven different forms. And we're not going to talk about those today. I just wanted to go, hey, I learned a fun fact today. The Bible talks about uh, more than just preaching, more than just offerings, more than just music and, and forms of worship. And I would, ta I would task you out. I would, I would ask of you to go and research those, those forms because knowing the different forms of worship uh, is, is akin to, to any skill. If you, if you were a, uh, a martial artist, knowing the basics so that you can go from your white belt to your black belt is necessary. So if you wanted to know uh, how to worship your Lord, it's necessary to know what those forms are. Otherwise, you can't discern what is a good testimony and what is a bad testimony. And with that, I want to I go over this real quick. Our passage for reflection was in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. And um, we're gonna talk, we're gonna touch on a couple things, a couple things today. But testimony is one of those things. It's like uh, it's almost like an earthly credit, an earthly humanly quote unquote credit, but yet it's not. And when I say that is because when you're out in the world, if you are known to be a trustworthy individual, that's your testimony. That's your testimony to others. Even non-believers give testimony. People we hear the word testimony and think, well, that's 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 a Christian word. That's a that's a church word. But it's not. Because non-believers give a testimony of who they are every single time they leave the house. They give a testimony to their family, they give a testimony to their friends, they give a testimony to their co-workers. They give a testimony to their kids. And in the same way, we, the, the brethren, the church, the Christians, the believers, the ones who follow Christ truthfully, well, you have a testimony as well. And your testimony says something about you to not just your kids, not just your wife, not just your boss, but every single person you come across. You go to the restaurant, you're giving a testimony about who you are. You see a family of, let's just give a random number, let's give a good number, a big number, so that you can understand, so that we can see clearly where there would be issues. To say if there's a family of eight, okay, mother and the father, the behavior of those children will give testimony to whether or not those parents are good parents. Now, not always, I understand, okay, I know little kids are very rambunctious and they're responsible for their own. And I know that there are exceptions where some children are just unruly and un, you know misbehave. Regardless of the testimony of the mother and the father, they are just... There are exceptions. But if you can look past all of that, you can see all of the little things that have gone into raising that child. I don't look at a small two-year-old and say, man, that kid has a bad testimony because he's jumping up and down. Well, he's a two-year-old. You have to accept some things. Some things you have to accept. But if that little kid at two years old is running around cursing everybody in a curse word that he heard mom and dad say at home, that's the testimony. That's the testimony. Where did he learn that word from? Or she? Where did, where did he or she learn that word from? Where did that child learn that word from? And why is testimony so important? Well, I think it's important to solidify who it's important for whom. For whom it's important. It's important to you, but it's more important to God. And it's important to Christ. And it's important to the others in the world, believe it or not. Your testimony tells others who you are. All judgments on you are made by your testimony. If your testimony is that of a drunkard, then you will be seen as a drunkard because you are bearing testimony to it. Your testimony bears witness to that. Your testimony will show the amount you drink, the amount of money you spend, and how often you drink. 
That should that that tells that says something to people. Your testimony testimony has told others that you're a drunkard. If your testimony is that of a liar, very few people will trust in you. Because your testimony has told others that you cannot be trusted. Likewise, if your testimony says to the world that you are dependable, then the world will see that too. Your testimony says you are dependable and they will depend on you. This is almost the same as reputation. However, the difference is that reputation can be falsified and padded, whereas a testimony cannot. You cannot pad it. You cannot falsify a testimony except through verbal. Now, that's a lie. We're, we're, that's, again, we're talking about false testimony. That's talking about lies. That's not the kind of testimony we're, here. we're talking about. We're talking about the kind that you see someone and you know, that man right there is a Christian because he's sitting on that corner and he's preaching to everybody here. He's a Christian. That's his testimony. Likewise, if that same individual goes out and has an affair, they're going to say, he wasn't a very good Christian because that's his testimony. Testimony is extremely important. It's not the same as reputation, but it's pretty close. Your testimony will give you a way to everyone that meets you. So I don't need to spend more than five, ten minutes with someone to realize who they are. I don't. I'm going to say something that's very sad. It's, 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 it's really only sad for me, but I'm going to say something that's very, very sad. I, at one point in my life, I had something happen to me. And because of that, I learned how to read people very well. Because it depended. I depended on my instincts to realize whether or not that person was mad, angry, or upset because it, would, it was going to mean something to me in that moment. Action was going to be taken against me depending on the mood of that individual. So I learned to read people. So I don't need to spend very much time with you in a room to find out what your testimony is. I'm going to know. I'm going to know. I'm going to see it. Now that's an earthly revelation because I'm, I'm human. I'm, I'm a flesh. I am, I'm here on the earth. And so those, those, my, my, my perception of your testimony may not always be correct because I'm human. I am prone to error. But to God, your testimony can never be hidden. Let's just think about how many people you meet on a daily basis. With every person you meet, you give in some fashion or another your testimony of who you are to them. Were you impatient in the line when you got there? That's your testimony. Were you angry, angry when you were driving and honking at everybody on the road? That's your testimony. He said, well, I'm not, I'm not a bad person. That just happened one time. I only got upset. I understand that. But what I'm saying is that there's billions of people on the earth. And if, only, if you only encounter one for one instance at one time, guess what? That's your testimony to them for the rest of their life. They don't see the whole in the sum of your life. They only see you in that moment. Your testimony gives everything away. How many people do you come across every day? It's a lot. And you give your testimony in. And do fashion every single time. Of who you are to them. Maybe you go to church every Sunday. Every single Sunday. And you come across one individual in the supermarket because you got, I don't know, into an altercation. Maybe you got heated. Maybe the line was too long. Maybe it was going too slow. And this person has never met you before and they don't know that you're a devout Christian. They don't know that you go to church. They don't know that this is the day you have a failing. All they see is that moment. That's your testimony. And even more so, if you have things, maybe maybe, uh, uh, maybe you're carrying a cross, they go, oh, well, well they're a Christian, no wonder. They're super self-entitled. They think that, they, that everything's for that. They think that, that they know everything. And I don't think that's the kind of testimony Christ wanted us to give, right? Sometimes those words, sometimes through actions, our testimony is spread from individual to individual. For the non-believer, 
that will take the shape of actions and words void of God or Jesus Christ in them. So, for those of you who are, who are Christians and have been in the faith for a long time, you say to yourself, well, how do I, I've never been good at reading somebody else's testimony. Well, okay. Look at their actions, look at their words, and then perceive in you. Look, look inward and, and look into the Spirit, look into the Bible, and see if their actions are driven by the flesh or if they are driven by God. Because a non-believer will make every action, they will speak every word without God or Christ in them. Now for the believer, well, you're not perfect. I know you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. That's why I try not to call anybody out in the middle of, I don't try to say, hey brother, uh, you remember that one time? No, I usually, I usually concentrate on myself. I usually, I usually set myself in an area and I let you guys watch as I throw stones at myself, okay? Because that is really the only way for me to give the example. I cannot bear testimony on the things that you do or you do or, or that brother. This is, I can only bear testimony to the things that I do. So, for the believer, testimony takes shape in Jesus Christ. You are not perfect, but it will take shape in the actions and the words that come from the Holy Spirit. You'll know. I'm a, I, have, I have a lot written, but I want to I stop here real quick. And I want you to consider, right now, what my testimony is, right now. Like I said, I like to use myself as an example. But right now, my testimony is that I'm here, right? I'm, I'm, I'm reading the word, I'm interpreting, I'm, I'm giving edification. We've just gone through worship. Right now, this is, this is my testimony. But let's say that I leave today. You leave here today. We drive off, and then somewhere throughout the week, you turn on the news and you see my face. And then some announcement that I have done something terrible and horrible. What does that say about my testimony? Regardless of whether it's right or wrong, whether I've been framed or not, the, the worldly vision of who I am, my testimony is being broadcasted. Let me tell you guys something. Brothers and sisters, if you are not aware already, the adversary, this, there is a proxy war going on. Who knows here what a proxy war is? If you don't know what a proxy war is, this is what a proxy war is. So a proxy war is when you go to war for someone else under a different name, but really you're fighting for somebody else. Okay? I'm not, I'm not going to pull up big names, but I need you, I, so that you can understand. I'm not trying to paint a target on my back, but so that you can understand. If one of the other pariah countries, and if you don't know what pariah means, it's, it's some of those countries that are just not recognized. If one of those pariah countries decided they wanted to have a war with a neighboring country but did not want to go through the problem and the issues of diplomatic issues by having that war, they will pay somebody else to wage war on that country and sit back and watch. That's a proxy war. And as, and as we studied before in the past, and if you know, if you've read your Bible, you know that Satan fell from grace. Because of a rebellion, he wanted to usurp the, the throne. He wanted the kingdom of heaven for himself. He wanted to be the Almighty. We, human beings, you, me, every single person here, your mother, your father, your daughters, your sisters, your sons, your uncles, your aunts, your cousins, your second cousin, your second aunt, all of them, every single human that is made of flesh, you are the proxy war. If you didn't know that. The adversary is not happy that he lost that war during that Great rebellion. So he's doing the next best thing. He wants to destroy you because you're the proxy war. He's not doing it because he hates you. He's doing it because he hates God. They are not two sides of the coin. 
Like people try to say, well, you know, there's darkness and there's light. This is like, no, my friend, the devil is not two sides of the coin. He is not great. He is not greater or equal, and even evil in comparison to God. He's still a nobody. Consider this: that hell was not made for man. Have you ever considered that? It's not. It's not made for man. It was made for the angels. But God allows us to choose to enter hell if we so please, if we so want to, if we so choose to. He doesn't force you to go. He's not making you go. You're choosing to do that. I would, I would, I would, I would akin this to the same thing. Let's say that you have, you're, you're a teacher and you have students. One of your students comes and says, I gotta go. And this teacher's learned that every day at 12 o'clock the student has to go to the bathroom. And so every day at 12 o'clock, the teacher goes, hey, can you go to the bathroom? The student goes, yeah, I can go to the bathroom. He goes to the bathroom. That teacher has given that student the liberty at 12 o'clock every single time to go to the bathroom if they need to. But if at 12 o'clock, that biological clock starts working and his stomach or her stomach starts to get all ooh and, and, and it's not in a good place. It's not sitting right. And then all of a sudden, hey, do you need to go to the bathroom? And they choose not to go and they make a mess right there? Whose fault is that? Who made that decision? The teacher didn't make that decision. The teacher gave him every ample choice, every ample leverage to go to the bathroom, but they didn't. This is the same concept. It's just on a bigger scale. God is not commanding you to go to hell. He's allowing you to choose that. If that's what you want to do, that's free will. And we exercise that free will with every decision we make, whether sinful or not sinful. Heaven is also separate. As I said, hell was never intended to be a place for humans. It was always going to be a place for fallen angels. Turned demons because of having known good, they turned away and had fallen. God allows each and every one of us to choose if we want to go there as well because of the free will. But it was never a place for humans. Heaven, like I said, is also separate in such a way. Your flesh and sin keep you from entrance to heaven because of the testimony of Christ. Because he was able to He's God's son. Of course he was able to. He overcame the flesh and sin. He overcame death. The testimony is what's going to grant you entrance into heaven or to hell? Your testimony. Did you believe in Christ? Your testimony. Did you believe in the world? Did you believe the world was flat? Your testimony. And we are undeserving of such a privilege. God did not want us to perish. Let's just open your Bible real quick and let's read really quickly in Matthew chapter 26, 59 through 68. Now this is going to be a lot of verses. I'm going to give you a second to find it. I'm going to do my best to read as, uh, as clearly and as comprehensively as I possibly can because I know that I speak a bit quick. I'm going to do my best to keep the speed and the, and the enunciation proper. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Though many false witnesses came forward, finally two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you. Let's just stop there for a second. 
We haven't even gotten to a, to a point in which we're talking about ourselves. We're just, we're only talking about the actions of Christ. And he had to bear testimony. He had a testimony. I know it's, it's kind of, these are, it, it, they're uh, aspects of the Bible we don't really, we, we, sometimes we don't, we don't think about it. But Christ had a testimony. And they couldn't find anybody with real evidence to come against them. Nobody had anything concrete. They made stuff up, but then they had to find the evidence to back that up, and they couldn't find it, and so they'd find others, and, and just people were coming out of the woodwork. Let's just make up stuff, and we'll see what sticks. Whatever we throw against the wall, and if it, and if it stays there, it stays there. If it doesn't, like, like, like my mom used to tell me all the time, si pera, pera, si no pera, no pera. And so finally, someone said, I got it, wait a second, hold on. You need testimony on his bad behavior? Okay. He said, this is what he said. This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Now, remember that the Sanhedrin, they were like, legal, religious scholars of the day. Like, Pastor Johnson has told us many times, they were, they were like legal religious representatives. It was like a, a job, a career for them. And so they already knew what they needed to find. But because they were human and they were not <coughs> close to God, they lacked the one thing you need when you're listening to the words of Jesus Christ or reading the Bible, and that is discernment. Well, how do you get discernment? So you can tell the difference. You have to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You have to be a follower of God. You have to have the Holy Spirit. Because only the Holy Spirit can help you to discern. That's where discernment comes from. You study your scripture, you study your Bible, because if these men had studied their scripture, Further, they would have realized that Christ was not talking about a building there in the city. He was talking about his own body. His own body as the temple of God was going to be destroyed and that it was going to be rebuilt in three days, meaning his resurrection. But they didn't understand that. They didn't get that. And by virtue of what they were doing, they performed their own Oedipus Rex, so to speak, and led themselves to the destination and the destiny of the crucifixion, to which all the acts were completed, the work was done. But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I charge you on the oath by the living God. Look at this man, the audacity of this man, the audacity of this man using what he has learned. I command you in the name of God to, to leave. That's basically the same thing as what he was doing. He was, he was, he was taking a fake Bible and was like, says it. I command you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And he said, you have said so, Jesus replied. And they thought, oh, he's, he's born. Oh, he's, he, just, he just nailed his own coffin. No. No, he didn't. He's telling you the truth. They just didn't, they lacked discernment. They could not see the truth revealed to them. He didn't say, yeah, that's what he said. He said, you have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes in dramatic fashion, because you know, that's what the, that's what's, what the regular thing was. They did this on, on, the, on the regular. And he said, he has spoken, bless me. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now, and look, now answer. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you. They did not understand his testimony. They, they could not discern what he was saying.
as they were fallen men, evil men, men bent on money and control. Christ didn't just stand up and proclaim his testimony. He lived his testimony. No one could find fault. As a matter of fact, they had to twist his words to convict because, that, because they did not have discernment to realize what Christ was talking about. The temple of God would be destroyed and rebuilt in three days? That's a huge claim. It's a big old building. What is he talking about? Is he a terrorist? Is he going to blow it up to prove a point? It was their lack of discernment that, uh, that allowed them to be blind to the fact that what he referred to was the work on the cross and his rising from the dead, his conquering of death and putting to an end to the law of Moses and beginning the legacy of redemption through Jesus Christ. This was Jesus Christ's testimony. That testimony that all the way to the cross, that, that is why we come here. Amen. That is why you come here. That is why I invite people. That's why you invite people. That's why you read your Bible. Everything is centered around this testimony. And that's why it is so important that you guard your testimony. You should have a shield and a sword with you every single time you leave the house. You should be prepared every single time you leave. I recall, I recall the, the I recall, I recall a story from a friend who said, "I'm going to go and I'm, I'm going to go and participate in this thing, and it's this interview a, a Christian thing." I said, "Wow." Well, and they left and went out to the world to this Christian event and met other Christians and the next time I saw this person and I, and I asked them how did it go the response was not good I was like, this is supposed to be a Christian event right I said like, yeah man people were stepping out all over the place I was approached, not by one person, but more than two people. I was approached by a couple. I was approached by my roommate. All of them doing ungodly, unchristian things. That's their testimony. As I speak it from here to you, I am giving witness to that conversation, their testimony of these people that went to this convention and were in the vicinity of this Christian individual, their testimony is that of fornicators and adulterers and blasphemers. That's their testimony. And Satan, the adversary, was using them to attack this one grounded Christian brother. in order to unsecure his testimony. To tarnish his testimony. Because that's what the adversary wants. He wants you to fall. He wants you to, to give up. He wants you to give the worst of testimonies. The adversary will use your own testimony against you, and if your testimony is anything short of being a follower of Jesus Christ, you will be condemned by said testimony. Do not be afraid to deny yourself earthly recognition, earthly merit, or earthly gold, because the only testimony worth giving is the one that is filled with the works and examples of Christ given to us by his own acts and testimony. You have a testimony, and everyone can see it. That's not in question. What is in question is what you want your testimony to be. Because Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 to 33. I'm going to give you a second to get there because I want to make sure that you read it with me. 
What is in question is what you want your testimony to be. Because it says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Your testimony. Your testimony. When did I disown you? When you did not give the correct testimony. It was like he said earlier, uh, uh, later on. When you when when did when did we feed you? When did we when did we care for you? When did we give you COVID? Well, you you did every single time. You did that for somebody who was in need. And every time you didn't, you also didn't do it for me. Your testimony. It's so important. We like to think that our quote-unquote ticket to the Lord is, is, is just the work, that, but it, it, it's not just the work, because the work was already completed. It's like a little hall pass that the teacher gave the students so they can go to the bathroom. It's like this is, it's already, you, I already know you gotta go and talk. You, you gotta go. It's the testimony, your testimony. That's what makes that quote-unquote pass worth anything, your testimony. So what do I, what is my testimony? So what do I testify? I testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation through him. But if you deny God here by not caring and worrying about your testimony, he will do the same. So before we end service, I pose questions to you. These are my questions. What is your testimony? Ask yourself that. As you go home, as you eat, as you're with other brothers and sisters, as you're with your family, ask yourself, what is your testimony? And then I want you to ask yourself, what is your testimony saying about you to others? What is your testimony saying to other Christians? And then what is it saying to non-believers? Because as the Bible says, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve the world and Christ. You either love one and hate the other, or you hate the one and love the other. We must guard our testimony because we are representatives, and either some will say they are different, or they will say they are no different than I. I don't want to be the reason someone else distrusts the things of God. And if I ever have been, this is my moment in this present time to ask for forgiveness, to ask the Lord for forgiveness for any time I, have, I may have done so. Because that was not my intention. We must guard our testimony. As the Bible says, do not be a stumbling block for someone else. I would go further and say, do not mock Christ and his sacrifice by representing yourself as one thing but living another. Guard your testimony. The adversary looks to defile it with temptation. Do not let him win. And by proxy, show the world that you are no better and cause them to fall because that's what's happening when you fail to guard your testimony. Young ladies, every single time that there's another young lady is pregnant out of wedlock, or every time there's a, a male that has a baby with somebody that they're not married to, or, or cheats on a spouse, or, man, that's testimony. Why did that happen? I remember one time I was speaking to a, a very wise elderly lady, and uh, she, she told me, uh, you know, when people cheat, they don't they don't really they don't really plan to cheat, it just happens. You don't plan it. But then they have you right. But it's 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 true. It's not planned. See what happened was that that individual was not guarding their testimony. And they allow the devil to tempt them and to come into their life and say, this is good. 
Nowadays, not guarding your testimony can mean a whole lot more consequences. From the sexual aspect, it can cause in, in, impromptu pregnancies, it can, it can cause people can pass STDs. There was a real dramatic story, and I'm going to end here. There was a real dramatic telling that my, my pastor, uh, Pastor Arugula, when I was a kid, he used to, he used to tell all the time. He, he would tell us the story of this young man that went into the world, he said he was going to go find himself. And he had, he had wanted to experience everything the world was offering, all of the alcohol, all of the parties, all of the women, all of the money, all of the drugs. And he went out, and he went out to a, to a bar, and he met somebody, and they hit it off. Everything was great. They danced until the eve of the morning. To which they retired to a room together and were intimate. And the next day, this young man woke up and looked in the mirror and saw himself but could not find her. And he looked everywhere. He went and checked the bathroom to see if she had been. Maybe there was a note. Maybe she just didn't want to wake up with him. Maybe there was something. But then as he walked into the restroom and found the mirror, written across the mirror in lipstick was, Welcome to the World of AIDS. True story. And I remember he would tell us that story all the time. And it made me think twice before I ever committed a sin about, especially in regards to fornication. Because I did not want to wake up to a mirror full of lipstick. Now, I mean, you don't hear about that one that often now. Because the, the stigma is gone and, and, and there's treatments and you know things do happen, we understand. I'm not saying that you're perfect, but you do need to guard your testimony. You are a reflection of your testimony, and your testimony bears witness to who you are, what you are, what you're about, and where you're going. So guard your testimony so that when others see you, they don't see another human being that is just like them. They see something different. And they don't know what it is, but they wish to desire that bit of difference, that whatever it is. And that's how it should be. Your testimony should be radiant and everyone should be flocking to you and be like, what is different about you? What is it that sets you apart? I don't understand. I've been watching you for a while. And that's what you, that's what you let him have it. Well, my testimony is in Jesus Christ. My testimony comes from the Holy Spirit. I do these things, I say these things, I make these actions, not because it pleases me, but because it pleases my God. That's right. Because it pleases my Lord. Because his testimony his testimony was that the temple would be destroyed and then rebuilt in three days. His body was to be crucified and his spirit would conquer death. Christ would conquer death. That is his testimony. And since that's his testimony, I want to guard it. Because through his testimony, I will be allowed to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not because of my testimony, but because of Christ's. Because of the work that he did. What is your testimony? When you leave here, think about that. What am I telling the world? Are you telling the world that you're like them, or are you telling them that you're a Christ follower? And for the non-believer, what does it mean? For the non-believer, it's the same thing, really. You're just not concentrating on God. 
but you still give a testimony to everybody you meet. And they'll either trust you or not trust you based on it. So I'll give you some self-help goodness right now for those who are non-believers and have chosen not to, not to believe. You need to guard your testimony anyway. There's your character. That's your character. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, so much for everything that you have given me, Lord. I thank you for watching over me and taking care of me and supplying me with all the things that I need on a daily to be able to continue my life and my service to you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for bringing me here today. I thank you, Lord, for allowing us to worship you, to learn from your word. I thank you, Lord, for allowing us to, to worship in your name and sing. Lord, I thank you so much for the work of salvation on the cross. We love you, Lord, and we ask that you would put your hand on us, on our church, on our state, on our country, on our people, Lord. We need you. We need you. I ask, Lord, that you would work in the hearts of those as you have always done who do not believe that they may come to see you as the only real truth. And we ask all of this, we request all of this, we make this proclamation in your name. The powerful name. The name that bears king above all kings. Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all.